It's good to be here. A few years ago, my mother and I, at the death of my grandmother, were looking through a box of objects. And we found, let me get my clicker, let you see it this way, five metal casket markers, five of them. Neither of us knew about these five metal casket markers. And we also found this post-mortem photograph and on the back is written, my sister. Postmortem photography was popular, or it was the thing to do in the 19th century. And it was a way in which you would mark the passing of a person. In fact, many times the, the deceased was actually photographed with the family as, as part of an understanding that the person who is gone is, is captured in our memory. And then we found a little tattered yellow piece from the newspaper, and it says, born to John Nelson and wife, the evening of July 7th, a baby girl. But before the break of another day, the young life had passed away. This is a sad case. It is the fifth child that is born to them who have all gone to join the angels within a short time after their birth. Now, isn't that Richard the Tame Death? Now, I'm telling you a story that's 110 years old. This was in 1896. For this reason, this is an example of a tame death. Now, the language I'm going to use is death in the moral order. I have a favorite article that is now 40 years old, 80 years after the death of my, what would they be, my great-great-grandparents. And Eric Castle says in the article called Dying in a Technological Age, that death in, by 1974 has shifted, fully shifted from the moral to the technical order. Now, actually, Richard set me up nicely here. Think, of, I, I, even if we don't know that somewhat arcane language, what is the moral order? Y you can guess what it would be. The moral order is human solidarity, sentiment, conscience, and knowing what to do that arises out of a sense of the good, the moral. It is communal. Death used to be in the moral order. Castle says it's shifted to the technical order. And Richard actually explained that nicely to, for us too. What is the technical order? It's efficient. It responds to a need. It's immediate. And it isn't immoral, but it is non-moral. A, a technical uh, technical devices can be used for either good or ill purposes. Now, what happens when death, as unknown to us as it is, as terrifying as it can be, what happens when human death meets the technical order? Richard explained that to us. Here's what Castle says, and see if those of you who are clinicians, this doesn't sound accurate. When the technical order meets the dying human being, we have a focus on parts over whole, structure over function, body over person, survival over maximum function, and life over quality of life. And he goes on to say the findings of science becomes the accepted image of the dying person. And I can tell you with 25 years in the ICU, often what we would do with very people who lived there, when their loved ones came in, we would say their x-rays a little bit better, their blood gases have improved a little, and in fact, we taught them how to interpret blood gases. They knew, and they'd say, well, um, what's this a matter crit this morning? That became our conversation 
for dying people. And it's completely and totally acceptable. And in fact, we see it as our job to inform, to share our understanding as clinicians. I'm going to give you now some images instead of the moral and the technical order. I love these two because this is contour drawing by Elizabeth Layton. Let's call her the patron saint artist of the Center for Practical Bioethics. A Kansas American artist, activist, feminist, and human sufferer with us. She drew this picture of what I would say is death in the moral order. You can see where is the person dying. There is a cuckoo clock. It's the weights run out of time. An old arthritic hand offering a teaspoon of tea to the dying person. Death in the moral order, an image. Here was her image of her fear of death in the technical order. This is fear. You see a feeding tube. You see a cockroach in an open mouth. Uh, horrible images, fearful images of meeting death in the technical order. Death in the moral order. How often do we see this? A silky-haired six-year-old sitting by a 93-year-old dying grandpa, peacefully holding a hand. This is a drawing by the mourners by Benny Andrews. He took care of his wife for five years, dying of cancer. And when she, he couldn't manage the symptoms anymore, she went into the hospital. And he wrote of this picture, notice the sick person in a stretcher far from the family. And he wrote of that, I took care of my wife's every need for five years. And at the moment of her death, I was ushered out of her room by an intern who had never met her to pronounce her dead. Death in the moral order. This is a 19th century drawing. Look at those little spirit creatures in the back. People around, a priest with folded hands. And death in the technical order, 19th century again. The vulnerable person lying exposed with strangers as onlookers intending to help, intending to know, intending to learn, but the most vulnerable person lies exposed in a bed of strangers. Now, before you think I'm saying that the technical order, I, that we can return to technological innocence, we cannot. We can't become pre-scientific. We are in the context of the technical order. The reason I shared the context of 110 years ago, we all die in a context. Our, what we can expect is determined by the context we live in. So it isn't as though we are at war with technology. We, we can't turn it back. In fact, it doesn't work. We live with it. So we have to find ways in which we can ask ourselves, uh, Emerson wrote, things are in the saddle, riding humankind. We have to ask the question is how do we come to some way of managing our technology that is useful and helpful to us? Another quick cartoon. Uh, Martin Luther wrote, the Reformation uh, scholar, said, if heaven, if there is no laughter in heaven, I don't want to go there. Well, this might be the new uh, criterion, right? See all those papers on your desk? Um, is there Wi-Fi? Now, the reason I show this is for this reason. It isn't as though technology, and you probably pictured machines or heavy-duty drugs or dialysis, things. But actually, the technical order is all pervasive. It is as though you take a drop of food coloring and the way it just spreads into water. 
it infects everything. Our way of understanding the world, our way of knowing people, our way of behaving, our way of thinking. This isn't a matter of a checklist of ticking off five machines you don't want. This is a complete reorientation of the human project, the technical order, especially in the face of dying. So I have a method for us. How, the, the title of this conference is Reclaiming Death as a Human Experience. And, and I would say, how do we come to some understanding of the technical order so that we live in balance with the human project and technical possibilities? The truth of the matter is, if you think about it, five little ones put to an early grave doesn't happen as often. And that is an amazing gift, at least in countries where there is food and water and technological capacity. So before we get too um, concerned about removing technology from our lives, tremendous opportunities. Babies don't die as often uh, before they each reach the age of two days. So I am going to propose a method. How can we take this terrifying sometimes, certainly confusing quality of death and come to some understanding of how we can merge that in our current context with our technical capacities? The method I'm going to offer is mindfulness. Uh, have you noticed how much mindfulness is, how many of you are nurses? And mindfulness is all over our literature. For these reasons, medical errors, and although we know there are system problems, it doesn't matter how smart you are if you're not paying attention. Compassion fatigue, we, we are starting to look at mindfulness as a way to address compassion fatigue and multitasking and disenfranchisement and distancing ourselves from patients, mindfulness. So a little bit, I'm gonna to have to skip over the top of an, a, a topic that could be an hour long in itself. Just a few high praises for mindfulness. Pascal says, all of our troubles, this is, an overstatement, sort of Zen, all of our troubles stem from our inability to sit quietly in a room. Find the truth in that and sit with it. William James, psychologist and uh, probably the father of modern psychology and a philosopher writes this, a little more wordy but accurate, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. That is morality. So this capacity that we have to voluntarily bring back our wandering attention over and over again, to pay attention to the other, is the seat of morality. No one is master of the self if he or she have it not. That is mindfulness. This is John Kabat-Zinn, who is probably the preeminent uh, American author writing about mindfulness, says this, awareness, and I will add to that awareness of death and awareness of being caregivers of the dying. Awareness of that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, and to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. Again, awareness of dying emerges from paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, to the unfolding of experience over in the moment by moment. So we are going to do an exercise in mindfulness. I, I'll also say this. If you think that mindfulness sounds passive and relatively insignificant, 
I would argue this, that mindfulness is the very beginning point for every caring conversation. It is the beginning point for compassionate, meaningful engagement with sick and dying human beings. And it is the very seat of activism. My very favorite author on mindfulness is uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese Buddhist. And he writes just exquisitely about mindfulness in only the way a Buddhist can do. And the last chapter is called Engaged Buddhism. He is a, this pious Buddhist monk, and yet he is the preeminent uh, spokesperson for healing the wounds of the Vietnam War. He is traveling around the country, uh, sort of undoing the damage of war, rebuilding the country, activism flowing from sort of a mystical, meditative understanding of the world. So this is not passive. It is the beginning of everything. So we were going to do some mindfulness, and the way we will do that is to listen to a story. In fact, you'll notice how often the center focuses on human story. That's because we are stories. We are storied human beings. We have a beginning, a middle, and an end just like a book does. Our stories emerge. Our stories change. We write different endings to our stories. We think in stories. We think in images. How often do we say this? I can't picture how you would do that. I can't picture it. We think in stories. In fact, we remember stories. How, isn't it interesting that a 110-year-old story of a child who lived one day now informs us in a way that you will likely remember long after some of the bullet points. That's because we are storied creatures. So I'm going to tell you a story. Last night, if you didn't get a chance to hear Will, um, reading a book club with his mother as she was dying, stories and books go together. In them, we find how it is to act in the face of dying, how to live, and how to accompany others in their death through stories. And one other thing that I, I want to point, or this is just biographical now. I was an English teacher before I became a nurse. And I want you to just look at this image and realize that the woman here inspired me to become a nurse in one moment in time. Uh, the story, as you will learn, is of my husband who was desperately ill. And at one point, he had such exquisite pain, we didn't know what to do other than to take him to the hospital. And a beautiful black nurse, white crisp uniform, white hat, came with a syringe, and I'm betting it was morphine, and she said, this will help. And I thought to myself, what an amazing job you have. You are here at a precise moment in time to relieve my suffering and his suffering. And I thought, what better job is there in the entire world than to be able to do that? So picture this is my story, but this is a universal story. This is a story about life and death. Therefore, it is our story. Picture yourself, remember yourself as a character in a drama. You are in a character in a drama in your stories every day. So picture yourself in a life story. On with the story, sit with it, sometimes mundane, sometimes sad, sometimes joyful. Sit with it and see what it teaches you about dying in the moral order. I will say just in terms of the timing, this uh, event happened the same year that Eric Castle published his article, Dying in a Technological Age. So I see in this lots of images of death in the moral order. There were no bone marrow transplants yet. 
we were just on the edges of the hospice movement, I think when, 1971, when Cicely Tyson, Cicely Tyson <laughs> Saunders brought the hospice movement to the U.S. Was that right, Martha? Yeah. Uh, so on the cusp of Eric Castle's noticing this shift and dying going on, here is my husband, Jim, as a student teacher. And here, here's Jim after the uh, Vietnam War in the 60s happened, <laughs> if you see the difference. Um, Jim was diagnosed with an accelerated type of leukemia. The same week that I found out I was pregnant with our third child. And so we had this drama unfolding of living and dying and not knowing which would come first. We, met, we of course, uh, had physicians, but mostly I recall they gave us numbers about blood counts and about what next. And that was helpful, but it had nothing to do with living and dying. We lived a little more biography. We lived in what we now call a commune. We, you know, this is 60s and 70s. A lot of stray folks, you know, an English teacher that didn't have a place to live, and one of the first women seminarians in the Lutheran seminary, and uh, a, a single woman with two children, and Jim and myself. And so we had this built-in community, and we had two other children, a six-year-old, Jimmy, here, and 18 months, Joshua. I show this slide for a reason. Very young, Josh knew the difference between broken and whole. His brother had planted, you know, in kindergarten where you plant grass seeds, and then you, look, you water them every day, and you look in, and you see the grass seeds sprout. Joshua was exploring Jimmy's grass seeds from kindergarten, and they, the pot slipped through his chubby little fingers and fell to the floor, and he began to wail. Broken. Broken from the beginning. At an early age, we know broken. And taking care not to use time as if it were our own. I cut this out of felt and put it on our kitchen wall. One of the tendencies of the technical order is it absolutely de despises uncertainty. As Richard said, if we don't know, there's another test that we will give you where we might know more. We cannot live with uncertainty. The truth of the matter is, most of our unwillingness to be mindful and present is that we are either living in a past we cannot change. I, the diagnosis was not going away, and the baby was growing. A past we cannot change, and a future we that we don't understand. We don't know how this will unfold. What will come first? So we are between these two poles of a past we can't change and a future that we do not know. And our only option for living, our only option for living was to live in such a way that we did not use time or think of time as either past or future, but instead present. And living that way, one behaves differently. You don't forget to leave a note on the kitchen table. I love you. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Forgive me. Joshua wrote too. <laughs> See, did I skip one? This is a night. Yeah. Um, Communication between family members is exquisitely important when we are, when our powers fade. When, in 1974, you even went into the hospital for a blood transfusion. I mean, you, you just did it. That's the context. You, 
you didn't have outpatient transfusion centers. So Jim was in and out of the hospital for treatment, and he would take his, read his letters. We'd send letters up, and, and he would read them. When you begin to live in the present, everything becomes a sacrament. That is, lifting the ordinary into the extraordinary. Even tying a shoe is a sacramental act. Lifting a child. Joshua, at 18 months, learned quickly that the telephone contained his father's voice. And he regarded the phone with wonder. In fact, you know how a, a dog looks like this when they hear a word that they know? It's just this innate wonder about that. And he would stare at that telephone and say, this, what is this object? Now, um, at an early age, this is, um, no, Grandma, listen, double-click the Internet Explorer icon. Um, prying kids away from their telephones is um, not a recent phenomenon. Now, I talk about this because one of the qualities of the technical order is we are by nature curious people. Isn't it wonderful, this technology? Or don't we wonder how this happens? It is a human quality to wonder. And so part of the technical order is driven by our wonder and our curiosity. And so he would fight for this telephone. And eventually he would win. Now here is one of the ways I believe we balance the technical order. What if the thing most wonderful was to be able to give one's attention to a sufferer as a rare and see it as a rare and difficult thing? It is, Lipson and Lipson say, almost a miracle. In fact, to give one's attention to another human being is a miracle. That's wonder. Recapturing, reclaiming death and illness as a human experience and recognizing the transformative power when we can do that. Most of life, and, and most many of us are caregivers in a professional capacity, we see people episodically, but they go home. And they go home to children and to cooking and to feeding each other. And Joshua used to like to compare abdomen sizes. <laughs> um, that's A and D ointment for, uh, um, it was winter, chap lips. We, um, Jim wanted to live. And why wouldn't he? 29 years old two children, a baby on the way. He wanted to live, and we believed that food could cure us. We needed to believe that food would cure us. We were vegetarian. We took food seriously. This is Adele Davis's book, Let's Eat Right to Have Healthy Children. We, we, com we cooperated with nature for wellness. We, we needed to do that. That was, if you will death and illness in a spiritual human dimension where it, where it belongs. We took walks in the country. Human beings also take care of each other even if they don't know what they're doing. Um, and, and, that's a, and we try things. We just plain old try things. I think we have to. We, we are called upon to uh, build up our own lives and to take care of one another. Oh, yeah, that. Um, you can tell this little guy was uh, a handful. <laughs> he sprayed that Lysol into his eyes and ended up with a little ER trip and a, you know, lavage of his eyes and so forth. But um, Will's conversation last night about the power of books as his mother was dying and his reading and the book club he said that when he was little, his nose was always in a book. And he said, my mother 
uh, was never the kind of mom that says, put down that book and go out and do something. She knew that in reading and getting into another person's life world, I was doing something. I was learning. I was growing. I was thinking. I was becoming more human. Jim and I read all the time. Here's a trip to the bookstore. I remember that he, I remember the books. He picked up his second copy of Aldous Huxley's, what's the name? Pardon? No. Um, uh, perception, Doors of Perception. And I picked up a biography on Janis Joplin. <laughs> Reading. Staying engaged, uh, reading was about all we could do. Jim was a school teacher, and in fact, as I show you these rather intimate photos, I should tell you this much, he would love to be here. He was a teacher. If my life in any way can start a conversation, can bring out wisdom or understanding, he would be thrilled that, that you're here. His school students made him this sign. It says, God touches us in the same way that the world and other people touch us, calling us to be more open and more human. We weren't perfect with our diet, I will have to say. He loved his pastries. Look at this one, a book in the lap. Um, there is a picture of the moral and the technical order sort of fused. A human being in a wheelchair, in the queue, waiting for something, with the poems of Robert Frost in his lap. There it is again. He was reading that, Robert Frost. Sitting in Dr. Shapley's, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. getting his finger stuck, and there sits in the middle of it all the poems of Robert Frost. I don't know if you can see the expression on Jim's face. This is a simple chest x-ray, simple to us, those of us who are clinicians. Look at the wonder, if not fear, of seeing that big machine come down toward him, and how often when we are unmindful the things we do to people or expect or even starting an IV and coming in with our stuff and our tape and tearing it off and standing over and getting started, how that action in the technical order is so alien to the person who has never had that done before. And so explaining things becomes part of humanizing the technical order. She's starting an IV there, I think. Jim was a Memphis all-star basketball player, all-state. And he sort of thought the baby was a little bit about the size of a basketball. Um, we, we thought these radiation marks were interesting. And I didn't know at the time just actually what a... His spleen was huge, and it had to be radiated just for whatever sets of reasons. But... We were curious about these um, radiation marks. Here is a picture, I think, of mindfulness. Her emotions value the emotions of others. Her thoughts value the thoughts of others. His words value the words of others. His actions value the actions of others. Therefore, all is accomplished that needs to be accomplished. Some of the uh, pieces, this is from the Tao of Dying. I don't know if you know the book, um, author Smith and Pittman. So the, any slides you see like this are, I, I read this book often as a mindfulness reminder. Susan, that's Jim's sister, flew from New Guinea knowing that things were happening in our lives. And you can just see her letting Jim Jim and his experience enter her own experience. A child again. I was, had a difficult pregnancy, and um, something was happening here. But you see the child in the middle of it, fearless, because he had with him 
caring adults who were walking, it, it was natural that dying was intergenerational, natural, not odd, not like rules about who can see who and where. Jim is worried here. Jim is very sick here. Here's something that perhaps we worry about, being in a mindful state. Are we in a mindful state just sort of swallowed up by the suffering of another? The answer is no. In a truly meditative, aware state, we become vulnerable, but in taking the, in the other person, we remain grounded in our own authenticity. This isn't a matter of just absorbing. It's a matter of suffering entering us and flowing through us without judgment is the key thing. So the grounding in one's own authenticity and desire to care is what um, keeps the caregiver of, of the dying uh, healthy. We worried, you'll see there, um, as I said, there were no options. We had a bunch of pills, and that's all I remember, a bunch of pills. No bone marrow transplants, uh, transfusions, hospitalizations for uh, gout even, and pneumonia and flu and because he was so vulnerable. But this says human cancer gene uh, possibly discovered. I remember we sat there hoping and believing and praying for miracles and cures. We simply had to. Um, we worried about bills. You can see Joshua is, he's like the lilies of the field, right? Uh, not worried, he's mindful actually of his Wheaties box. Um, think of what people are concerned. Here's a picture of unmindfulness. A child reaching for comfort and a mother distracted by the bills. Jim couldn't um, he got extremely fatigued. He probably had a red count inconsistent with walking around, but I entitled this part of my presentation, Hanging On and Letting Go, as an essential human response to our human dilemma. Hanging on and letting go. The technical order cannot stand ambiguity. It seeks clarity. Its machines ever seek to be more finite. I must know precisely. But think of this, the human person dying. Dying and living are not simply physical processes. They're spiritual. They're Hard to, they, they can't be quantified. They are even hard to describe. And so we put this event of human leave taking from everything you love and put that in a technical order, it doesn't fit. And so one of the ways I think that we address and tame the technical order is the most sophisticated intellectual skill, I think, and I, I see too little of it in our public discourse, in our political discourse, an ability to tolerate ambiguity. There is not black or right. There is rarely clearly right and clearly wrong. This ability to sit with ambiguity. Uh, this past year, Bill and I have uh, partnered two very dear friends, one age 60 and one our age closer to 70, uh, stage four diagnoses, and both of them out of the box, I want to live. Of course you want to live. Of course you want to live. And the part of me that knew the details wanted to uh, say, but how do we at the same time help you live, but also be willing and ready to make sure that your living is not complicated by the symptoms of your dying. 
that's ambiguous. That is not clear. And too many times when patients say, I want to do this, I want to live, I think we kind of just step back and say, okay, well, have it then. Um, here's all we can do. The ability to understand that living and dying happen simultaneously, that is highly ambiguous. That is the way we balance the technical order, is in this mental process of tolerating the unclear, the, un the ambiguous. There's one of very few pictures of the six-year-old. He um, could be another whole discussion about children and dying. He made himself absent. You might, in fact, wonder how I have all these photographs. One of the people in the community was a photographer, one of our commune. And he said, can I take pictures? And, of course, um, we didn't know it was dying, did we? We knew it was life. And so, of course, so he was taking all these photographs. We, we didn't even, I got these photographs sometime later and didn't look at them, actually, for about 11 years. And then I, I have learned so much from them since. The sick person is in a fragile body. One of the myths of our Western culture North American culture is the myth of independence. Dying people begin to know better. We must relinquish, all of us, the protection of our dignity and our values to others when our powers fade. We must. There is, our independence only goes as far as the fragility of our bodies. We took turns on who got the couch. Me sick with a pregnancy, Jim with a low hemoglobin, um, disease eating away at him. We began to understand and accept, which is difficult for many people to do, our great interdependence as human community. I think he just did something bad there. It looks pretty pathetic, but <laughs> he's getting a cold shoulder. Um, Looks like bad parenting now that I look at that one a little harder. Um, friends would come and gather to have conversations, Myra, to have conversations, to say, what are you reading? In fact, this guy was Jim, Jim's mentor, and the first thing he said is, what are you reading these days, Jim? Now, I'm sitting there uh, actually in labor, um, <laughs> disguising um, my condition, to be mindful of another person, one must stand in one's own socially constructed world and enter another's world by admitting, I don't know you. I do not know your subjective world. And the, the talk conversation happening after me are, are folks who are going to give us some views into other cultures. We live in socially constructed worlds and do not understand, even people within our own cultures, the lived experience of another human being unless we listen, unless we pay attention, unless we admit, I do not know. So off to the hospital. St. Mary's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. And by this time, Bruce, the photographer, um, had been taking pictures so long. Now, this is 1974, so the idea of uh, photographs in a delivery room were, uh, was a little out there. But we just said, well, come on along. Um, uh, there's a contraction. Looks like a happy contraction. Here's a not-so-happy contraction. And fathers in the delivery room wasn't even a thing. When you said, Myra, last night, you had to break some laws <laughs> to get the death you wanted. We broke a bunch of rules to have the birth we wanted. So Jim came into the delivery room. Many times uh, the end of life uh, conversation is, can we recapture death as a human experience in the same way that women have advocated for sort of re-owning birth process to some extent. Well, this, this is kind of prior to those days um, on a steel table. 
but with a marvelous physician. And there she is. And I see now how ill Jim was. Thin arms, wasting. But how happy. The human experience. Not long after the baby was born, he was up all night long in the delivery room, walking around, getting into scrubs. Probably within an hour of her birth, he took to the wheelchair. And he really didn't walk much again. He got a phone book offered by a nurse to call our parents. And he went home. He's talking to me on the phone. That's one of our folks in the collective reading to him, by the way, reading a book. For a symphony to be beautiful, there must be spaces between the notes. The dying will provide the notes. The caregiver will provide the spaces. Be attentive, listen, reflect, and allow. Community. These are a bunch of funky kids. Washington University, we're all vegetarian. We were in a food co-op buying our lettuce and our cauliflower. They heard about our situation. We, we didn't have much money. Jim had to quit work. And um, every twice a week, a college kid would cook a vegetarian meal, put it on the basket of his bicycle. We lived in the inner city. Ride his bicycle to the inner city, drop off the bulgur casserole on our front porch, and ride back home for three months. These bonds of human solidarity of the moral order. So we reorganize at home. And Jim has three precious days. And this morning he woke up. We're sleeping on a sofa bed because he can't walk the stairs. And he says, V, I'm dying. He knew. And there's Joshua, again, mindful of his toy. <laughs> and Jim's best friend, Bill. We went to the hospital. Uh, again, we had few options for when it was pain that made him know he was dying. Pain and just just uh, sick unto death and so tired. So we took him to the hospital. And, and think here. Here is a young student nurse in the middle of that drama. We're, we're all in the middle of these dramas. Um, When I look at this one, I'm always reminded about the importance. This is not the time to have a conversation, <laughs> is it? Um, now, I don't know what they were talking about. He was probably doing some explaining. But how much better to have conversations about the most difficult steps of our lives when we have, when we have our power, when we have our agency, when we can understand what people are saying to us. This is his father. I return to this. To give one's attention to a sufferer is a rare and difficult thing. It is almost a miracle. In fact, it is a miracle. You see the hands. This is another rule we broke. Babies weren't supposed to be there, but baby was in his bed. 
This nurse helped us break all sorts of rules. I mean, nothing mattered. <laughs> the caregiver of the dying has knowledge of the complex world. We do. We have knowledge of the complex world, yet the caregiver of the dying relies on the simple things, that a baby can lie in her father's deathbed. This was some last-ditch chemo thing, and it made him throw up. And I think back now, and I go, oh, too bad. <laughs> but we did. This is a pastor, our priest, who was there. And flights of angels carry thee to thy rest. He was able to give his eyes, and that's all of his body that was acceptable for a transplant or use. Um, back home, a different family. But yet a family. Uh, Jean was baptized at her father's funeral. For those of you who are Christian, you know some of the significance of that. So we baptized the baby and buried Jim. Actually, only three days after he died, all of his students showed up. Supported by a community, religion keeps you can keep you upright in a storm, or it gives this larger narrative. Uh, to which we can attach our lives. There is a bigger story, is, is what we were knowing. There is a bigger story that shapes and informs us. And this community uh, was part of that. In, in fact, it's just in this really homely way that we understand the bigger story. And so there is Jean, Jean and I. And here is Jean with Paloma Lopez. <laughs> The caregiver of the dying is a true giver of care in paying attention, non-judgmentally with intention, sitting with uncertainty, tolerating ambiguity, supporting and nurturing human community, allowing for that which seems intolerable, tolerating that which seems to be intolerable, and accepting that which looks like it is unacceptable. Life, 